Is the King James the perfect translation? Is it the only translation? Can you use other translations? Should you feel guilty about using other translations? Well, here we go. We're going to dive into this and the answer is no. The King James is not the perfect translation of the Bible. I'm going to give you a number of reasons as to why that is the case and you can decide for yourself. Just like here on this channel, we don't tell you what to think. We just want to inform you so that you can think for yourself and have the information at your disposal because we trust that you're an adult and you can adult for yourself. So what does it mean for the translation to be authorized? Was it authorized by God? Was it authorized by Jesus? Who authorized this thing? It was authorized by the King of England, King James. That's why it's called the King James Bible. Now, there's a few things you need to know about the 1611 King James Bible. The first thing you need to know is this. The King James translation was not a new translation. It's a revision. The very first rule that King James gave the translators was to follow the Bishop's Bible as closely as possible. Rule number 14 of King James's 15 rules, they can use Tyndale, Coverdale, with Church, or Geneva. These are all old 1500s and English translations. So basically the King James Bible itself is a revision. It would be like a, you know, the New International Version R revised. It should be BBR, the Bishop's Bible revised. The Bishop's Bible was the common Bible used in church in those days and they didn't want to alter that very much and so they basically are using the Bishop's Bible as the basis for their translation and he says and alter the Bishop's Bible as little as possible. You need to know that the King James Version didn't drop out of heaven. It dropped out of the 1500s Bishop's Bible that was then revised into the King James Bible. There were about 50 translators who translated the King James Bible. They were broken down into subgroups and committees to handle different books and sections of the Bible and to work in committee, which is very important, always makes for a good translation. And the King James Bible served an amazing purpose for many years, but it's become archaic. It's hard to understand some of the language. And if you don't believe me on that, try reading it through in a year and see how you do. Make a list of all the words that you don't know or are confused by. Because the meaning of words change over time. And the way we use a word today isn't necessarily the word, way it was used you know, in 1611. So the King James Bible also, from 1611 to 1629, also contained the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha are non-inspired books of the Bible. Uh, and you know, no one's saying that, that that's the perfect part as well. well. What is the 1611 Bible that everyone is saying is perfect or is the only one that can be, does that also uh, work for the ap Apocrypha? Here's what Bruce Metzger, one of the leading textual scholars of the Bible, said some years ago in his, in his book. It was not to make a new translation, nor yet to make a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one. He goes on to say, that's on page 76 of his book, The Bible in Translation, he goes on to say that although usually called a translation, it is, that is the King James, it is in fact merely a revision of the Bishop's Bible, as this itself was a revision of the Great Bible, and the Great Bible revision of Coverdale and Tyndale. So you start off with Tyndale, who actually lost his life for translating the Bible into English, and he trans translates the New Testament, a lot of the Old Testament, and, and then uh, they revise it, revise it, revise it, you end up with a King, King James Bible. So, you know, was, was Tyndale inspired? Was the, Were the revisers of Tyndale inspired? Like, you have to look at the development of the King James Bible to understand exactly what it is you're saying when you say this is the perfect translation. You're saying a re revision of a revision of a revision of a revision is the finally perfect translation. Now, there's some other reasons why this doesn't work out well. The, the translators actually uh, have a preface in the 1611. You should look up a little section called From the Translators to the Reader. And in that section, they basically say that God's Word has always been translated into the vernacular of the time. This happened when it went from Greek and Hebrew into Latin, what's called the Vulgate. It's happened into Syriac and other languages over time. And they said, now it's time for us to do this translation. And there will be other translations, basically, is what they say. And this is not the ultimate translation. They literally tell us the ones who translated it don't think this is the only one. Read the, read the, the message in the, called the Translators to the Reader. They give you a little message to give you a heads up about this. This should never have been seen this way. So there are a few other things. I've already mentioned the, uh, the archaic language of the King James Bible. There are just words that are very hard to understand. And I'm going to mention a few of those and just see if you knew this. Um, in, in King James English, 1611 English, if someone is halt, H-A-L-T, they're lame. Look at um, Mark 9:45. This man is halt. He's halt. He stopped. Well, he's lame. He can't move. Or lovers can be friends. That's Psalm 38:11 or Lamentations 1, 2, and 19. To suffer someone something doesn't mean that you're in pain. To suffer someone something means that you're permitting them. Matthew chapter 3, verse 15 and 19. 
44. So you can see these words that now have a certain meaning didn't mean the same thing back then. And when you're reading the Bible, it's very important that we understand the words, and it's completely unnecessary for us to have archaic language in the Bibles that we're reading. And there's many, many more. A mean man is a common man. A pitiful woman is a compassionate woman. You're full of pity. It's compassionate. We say a p pitiful person is, is, is a terrible place to be. No, it's a person in 1611 who is full of compassion and lamentations for 10. If something is a shambles, it's the marketplace. To wax great is to get bigger. A cockle is a weed. Uh, hosen are robes. To upbraid someone is to denounce them, to say something that's, that's negative about them. Somewhat is noteworthy. Common means unclean. Say common just means everyday stuff. Well, unclean, you get where that comes from. Or a besom is a broom. Get out your besom. My what? What are you talking about? So these are completely unnecessary things as we read the Bible. We, we, we don't really need to, to, to run into these kind of words that we have to translate the translation. So the words are archaic. Number two is this, an inadequate textual evidence. The King James translators had uh, manuscripts from about the 10th and 11th century up to about the 13th century. So these, these manuscripts were four or 500 years old, maybe 600 years old at best. Some people will say, well, they had Biza. Biza was from the 5th century, but Jack Lewis in his book uh, from the English Bible from the KJV to the NIV, excellent book, where some of this information comes from, he says there is no evidence that they, they had access or used or actually used the, the uh, Biza whenever they did the translating. So they're translating from manuscripts from the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s. And at that time, I mean, that's all they had. Now, in today's world, the translators, as they translate things like the, uh, the new the 2011 NIV and NRSV and some of these, New American Standard, they have over 5,000 manuscripts at their disposal that they're using. Not just from the 11, 12, and 1300s, but from the 100s, 200s, 300s. Makes a, a significant difference. It can in some ways. Now, the Bible hasn't changed an awful lot in that amount of time, but it's important for us to get as close to the original as possible. Not only do we have more textual evidence as far as copies of copies of copies that we have at our disposal to try to work through and find out what's the most original reading, we also have more knowledge of Greek. You have something called a lexicon, and I have one here, it's called Thayer, it's sitting here. And it's a Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. In the introduction to this book, Thayer mentions that there are nearly 800 words at this point in time, in the late 1800s, that they have in, in Greek that we don't have any other example of except in the Bible. Okay, so think about that. Of all the excavations, of all the documents, of all the Greek things that have ever been written, they're at this time in the late 1800s, not even the 1600s, in the late 1800s, there are almost 800 words that only exist in the Bible. Today, that number is about 50. There are 50 words out of all the thousands of words in the Bible that only, we only have evidence of in the Bible. When you get that many, that much more rich evidence, it's called lexical evidence, it's lexicon, it's like uh, you know these books that we look up word meanings in, the more information and data you get about how a word is used, the more context you get, the richer our understanding of that word becomes, then the more accurate our translation becomes. And then in the 40s, there were the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were almost 800 manuscripts found, this is 1947, that, that were found that shed light on the Old Testament. Before that, these go back into BC, several hundred years BC, Dead Sea Scrolls. Before that, our oldest Hebrew manuscript was from like 1000 AD. With the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, which they didn't have in 1611, we went back 1300, 1200 years into textual history to get older and older manuscripts that they just didn't have at their disposal. Now, I want to read something from D.A. Carson in his book on the King James Bible debate. He says this, The first edition of the Greek New Testament to be published was edited by Erasmus. This is in the early 1500s. To prepare his text, Erasmus utilized several Greek manuscripts, not one which contained the entire New Testament. None of his manuscripts was earlier than the 12th century. For the book of Revelation, he had but one manuscript, and it was lacking the final leaf, which contained the last six verses of the book. Therefore, Erasmus translated the Latin Vulgate back into Greek and published that. So the last six verses of Revelation in Erasmus' Greek New Testament, several words and phrases may be found that are attested in no Greek manuscript whatsoever. What is this saying? King James actually used that work by Erasmus to translate the New Testament. We see what Erasmus was working with and the kind of things he did to create the kind of texts that were used to translate the King James Bible. And, and all I'm saying, it didn't necessarily make the King James bad or evil. I'm just saying it is not perfect. It is not flawless. There are so many more better resources that we have at our disposal now. We don't have to go back and read archaic 
language. I remember trying out at a little country church back when I was first getting into full-time ministry, and, and I didn't know they were a KJV-only church. They were sweet people. Well, I walk in the door, I'm going to preach my sermon, and the man gets up, and he's going to read the scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 6, and he's talking about twain wings this and twain wings that. It's the angel with you know two eyes that are flying, and two that are covering their face, and two that are covering their feet. And I think, I'm going to have to translate the translation before I can even be begin my sermon. These are not understandable things. And there are many, many more words like that that... Uh, that we could go into in, in the King James Bible. In the King James Bible, there are unicorns. Did you know that? You know, when the King James was translated, it was translated as every day people spoke, just as the Bishop's Bible, the exact same thing Tende was trying to do. And people thought it was too vulgar, it was too ordinary, it was too common. In 1611, now we say it's, it's even hard to understand in common language today because language changes. If there ever was a time when the King James was, was more acceptable, it was closer to when it was written than it was, is 410 years later. And the King James Bible has actually gone through a ton of revisions. The King James 1611 King James Bible was revised in 1612. It was revised in 1613. They removed 500 errors just in the first two years. Scrivener came back and he was trying to analyze, as have three or four other people, how many variations there were in the first seven revisions of the King James Bible. And the number was between 20 and 24,000 differences. There's a, a story in the book God's Secretaries that talks about um, by Nicholson, and it talks about how the printer who printed the King James Bible was just kind of in chaos, and every single copy of the King James that came out, because they're just copying these things like a printing press copying, every single manuscript came out different, okay? If you want to say, is there a perfect King James Bible, 1611 King James Bible, my first reaction is, well, what revision are you talking about is the perfect King James? If it's the 1611, we know it's not perfect. There were 500 errors in it. Actually, maybe, and, and as the revisions came, 20,000, 24,000 errors in it. Which King James are you talking about? Which copy of the 1611 King James are you saying is error-free? So all these little errors crop up, just error in copying, error, errors in typesetting. Like in, uh, in the Ten Commandments where it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. There was a wicked Bible that said, Thou shalt commit adultery. There was one where Jesus is coming along, and it said, instead it said Judas is coming along. You know, there were all these different types of Bibles that, that uh, came about through these errors. There are times the King James adds a bunch of words that are not needed. There's a time times the King James takes out words that are absolutely needed. And so the King James Bible suffers from some fairly serious issues. They don't make it something that's unhelpful. It doesn't make it something that we can't understand God's word in its most basic sense. But it's a completely unnecessary struggle for us to struggle through the text in a way that we have to tra translate the translation. So keep in mind, the King James is a revision. It contained the Apocrypha. It has gone through numerous revisions. It's had 24,000 edits and errors within it over the last, I think, seven to nine revisions. It's a, a, again, it's a revision itself of previous versions. It's not even a new translation. The translators themselves told us that this was not the end all translation, that others would come and they would be good too. The textual evidence of what the, the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts they had were lacking. There, there are just enough reasons to look at the King James and say, this is not the perfect translation. Now, some of you are going to take uh, take me up in the comments on uh, Textus Receptus, the majority text, and all of that. And here, here's the one thing I'm going to say about that. And the majority text is basically saying, like, what is the most common reading of a given word? We're going to run with the most common reading. If you took all the, these Greek manuscripts and you laid them out and said, okay, which word should be here? Well, we're going to do a vote, a manuscript vote, and decide which word goes there. What's the problem with that? Well, if you copy something enough times, guess what? You get more votes. If you copy an error enough times, guess what? You get more votes. So the original reading, which is way back here, may only have a, a, an instance or two, but then once it gets twisted into some little typing error, or some little problem, and that gets copied over and over and over, it gets 100 votes, whereas the original gets two or three votes. So the, the, the majority text um, method is com just completely lacking. You have to go back to the quality of the text and, and the questionable nature or not questionable nature of the texts that are being used in these translations. So, uh, you know, maybe you've wrestled with this and you said, oh, you know, I just feel bound by my family, bound by my church, King James only. It's like, take a good look at it. And a lot of the things that are said about things like the NIV are absolutely made up. Uh, they're made up, they're misunderstood. It's the, uh, these newer translations are accused of many things that are untrue. I did a video, search the channel for the NIV and why they remove verses. That's a great lie that is brought up about the evil NIV, the satanic NIV, and things like that. Uh, so know your, know your own history, know your information. Don't just take things for granted.
do your own homework, do your own research, you know, look up, buy a copy of the English Bible from the KJV to the NIV. Jack P. Lewis, he was an amazing man, died a few years ago. Look up God's secretaries. Look up questions you've asked by God's uh, questions you've asked about Bible translation by again by Jack Lewis. And just do your homework and see where you land. Look up the NIV. Look up the New Revised Standard Version. Look up the New American Standard Version. If you're a big King James person but you want easier, better, more up-to-date modern language, look at the New American Standard Version. It's also an attempt at being literal. And there are other options that can be used here. But let's keep an open mind. Let's do our own homework and don't take anything for granted because at the end of the day, it's not what someone tells you. This is your own decision to make, and I'm not going to make it for you. So you're going to have to adult and make that decision for your own self. Uh, so we're going to keep providing these kind of resources, keep talking about things, keep informing, keep providing things that kind of help us grow in our faith, answer the kind of questions we're asking. If you have a question, throw it in the comments. Let me know what kind of questions you're asking, the kind of things you're thinking and talking about. And this is in no way or shape or form me saying that King James is evil. Please don't hear me say, King James is evil. I'm not saying anything like that. It's been perfectly fine for many, many years. It's just time to move on to another translation where we don't have these archaic things. We don't, we're not working through bad, you know, just less than perfect, less than adequate textual evidence and these sorts of things. Uh, so thanks for watching. Hang in there. Keep on tuning, tuning in the channel. You know, share it with a friend. Share it on Facebook. Put it on Twitter. Just copy that link, paste it, throw it somewhere. Tell somebody about it. Say, so just check this out. Uh, subscribe. We're about to hit 1,500 subscribers. I'm going to just, if you're hang, hung on for 20 minutes now, I'm going to let you in on something. At, at, at 1,500 subscribers and 10 more or 9 more subscribers, uh, we're going to do a book giveaway of John Mark Hicks's book, Searching for the Pattern. It's a phenomenal book about how we read the Bible and how that's shaped the way we do church. So when we hit 1,500, we'll do a giveaway on that. Be on the lookout for that. And uh, watch us, like us on Facebook. It's uh, facebook.com slash wineskins. And you can keep up with all the new videos that come out there, as well as posts at wineskins.org from all of our authors. We have multiple authors who write on multiple sites, and that's where we put all the links to that. So thanks for watching. Uh, we'll catch you next time. Please subscribe. God bless.